Hi, it's Kristen Atchison again, and we are still in Chapter 1, Foundations. And this time we're going to talk about the different laws and theories that we have um, in the foundations of perception. So this is our last video um, for Chapter 1. So we've talked about perception. Clearly, we are science, so we like to measure things. Um, and so there's been various attempts to really quantify this perception. One of the first major attempts was Weber's Law. And Weber's Law is a mathematical equation that tries to quantify that just noticeable difference um, based on the intensity of the stimulus, so how loud it is, how bright it is, um, and what kind of perception we're talking about. So are we talking about taste? Are we talking about vision? Are we talking about audition? Are we talking about touch? Um, I'm not so much interested in that you know the formula and how to calculate all that. Um, I am interested that you know kind of what I have written here, essentially, that we're talking about this relationship between the intensity of the stimulus and the mode of perception um, for that just noticeable difference. So right here we have um, Weber's fractions, and this is part of the equation. So if you're trying to calculate the just noticeable difference for taste, you would need to use the Weber fraction of 0.083. There's a different for each mode of perception. If you're trying to do um, touch and look at the perceptual dimension of heaviness, you would need to use 0.20 or 0.02, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, this is a kind of a, the constant, um, and then this would be multiplied by the, um, the intensity of the stimulus. So Weber was the kind of the first to kind of start to quantify this, and he did this back um, in the 1860s. So this is quite a while ago. So clearly this is not the be end at all and end all of quantifying perception. Next we have Fechner. Fechner built upon Weber, and he wanted to know how the perceived intensity of the stimulus changes as the physical intensity changes. So he realized that just because the physical intensity of something is changing, that doesn't mean that the perception of that would be the same. So just because you double the volume on your radio doesn't mean that you think it's twice as loud. Um, <clears throat> just because you put two light bulbs in instead of one, do you perceive that as twice as bright? This is what Fechner's law is attempting to calculate. Again, he's using a mathematical equation, and he built upon this Weber's law, um, and he added um, information in it. Um, and the exact shape of the curve that you get um, depends on, again, that Weber's fraction, because it is built upon that. So depending on the mode of intent, the, the mode of perception, the perceptual dimension that we're looking at here, um, Fetcher is going to say that how you perceive that intensity changes um, will be different. So um, here's an example um, of one of the curves from Fetchner's Law. And again, Fechner's law um, is Weber's law plus the assumption that um, one just noticeable difference um, equals one unit of difference in perceived intensity. So that's what he said. Again, he was doing this um, quite a while ago, so we've continued to build upon this um, in general. Um, next, we go to uh, Stephen Powers' law, and he said, "Nope, nope, nope. None of this. None of this is working. Um, it only works for some. Your your theory only works for some. Your law only works for some of the perception, some of the modes of perception. It doesn't really do all of them. Um, we don't always have this nice, um, really sharp curve and then flattening out. Um, we don't have that for all different kinds of perception." Stephen Powers' law says. So it reflects, this new law reflects the fact that the relationship between perceived intensity, perceived intensity and physical intensity is different for different perceptual um, dimensions. So while Fechner said, yeah, it's a one-to-one, -one. you put in two light bulbs, it's going to be twice as bright. Stephen Powers saying, no, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, it's going to depend whether you have, what kind of relationship you have depends on what kind of perceptual dimension we're talking about. Um, so line length is a really one-to-one, -one, easy one. You double the line, it looks twice as long, um, as you see here in this graph. You, um, brightness, however, has a very different shape. I mean, measuring um, that, that the relationship between perceived brightness and physical brightness. The same thing with electric shock. There's a very diff big difference in how that relationship looks. 
Um, so many dimensions, like brightness, are associated with that decelerating curve um, that we see here in this blue line, like we see in Fechner's Law. So there are, some of it was right, but the problem was that Fechner's Law wasn't right all across the board for all different modes of perception, such as electric shock. Um, that yields this kind of accelerating curve. Um, and then again, that line length is really kind of a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. Um, so this was the next attempt um, to, to really work on this. He was working on this in um, the, the beginning of the, the 1900s. So the problems with Weber, Fechner, and Stephen Power's law is they don't take into account other factors that influence perception. They're looking at this like a very mathematical, uh, very um, quantifiable thing. The problem is, is that you they're looking at it basically just from that sensation perspective. They're not taking into account top-down processing. They're not taking into account how we handle things. Um, so some people are more willing to detect, say that they detect something than others. Um, other people are very, very conservative about saying that. And there's also the problem that we're never really operating in a vacuum. Um, so there's noise in neural activity. That can be caused from just kind of outside noises. That can be caused from kind of internal changes. There's fluctuation in our neural signals. And so while um, the attempt to quantify this in a really uh, explicit way is great, um, the problem is that it doesn't, again, it's going from that very bottom up perspective. It's not looking at it from a top down, looking at the role of cognition um, in perception. And we know that cognition is really a big piece of that. Um, and so again, these three didn't really look into that. So the next one that we're going to talk about, um, the next theory that we're going to talk about really starts to do that. But first I want to talk a little bit more about this noise and neural activity. So noise. Um, I'm not actually talking about noise in terms of like actually you hear something. I'm not talking about one mode of perception. I'm talking about noise in terms of random error. Okay, um, so random error, this slight, and usually it's very slight, it's very minimal, but it's random error, okay? And we can have noise in anything. Um, if you've taken statistics classes, um, your T ratios and your ANOVAs are signal to noise ratios, where you're looking at how much variability um, there is in something. So you can think about noise as that variability. Um, and in terms of neural activity, there's variability um, in the number of action potentials produced by neurons in response to a fixed stimulus. So you can give them tone A that has a specific intensity, and sometimes those neurons are going to fire differently than that another time we give you the exact same um, intensity of a tone. Um, so here we have two different um, visual demonstrations of that. And what we're talking about is spikes uh, per trial, okay? So how many neuron spikes are we getting um, per trial? And we see that this is all when the uh, stimulus is present, okay? And sometimes we have very few spikes, sometimes we have a lot, and it typically resembles this normal distribution. It's typically pretty normally distributed. Um, but the problem is, all of those are yeses. All of those are yes, it's there. Um, so how does your brain decide, yes, it's there, when you have such variability um, in, your, uh, in your responses? Um, there's two main sources of this noise, or again, that variability in the neural response. The first of which is external. So this can come as some small random stimulus from the environment. So um, if you're doing a key press thing and you're listening to tones, um, the, the, your hand moving across the computer can be a noise, and that can increase those neural spikes. Those would be external variability. Um, it can also come from internal, um, and this can be fluctuations. Um, this can be things like such as body temperature, um, other metabolic things that will alter how your uh, neurons are firing. Um, 
hunger, things like that are going to influence and have caused these small fluctuations. Um, and so then the answer becomes, well, how do I know that I heard what I thought I heard? Um, or how do I know that I saw what I thought I saw? Um, again, Fetchner and Weber and Stephen Powers Law didn't look at to any of this. They didn't look in that top down, that decision making process of yes, I heard it or no, I didn't hear it. Um, and so the next theory we're going to talk about, signal detection theory, really separates perceptual ability from the decision bias. So that ability for us to, to either sometimes say we heard something that we didn't hear or say we didn't hear something that we really maybe did, these differences, signal detection theory tries to start to parse those apart. And so signal detection theory is this framework for measuring how people make decisions based on the fact that they have these noisy neural signals, that they have these variations in their neural signals, uh, based on the fact that they're going to have different spike rates um, for the same stimulus. How do you make that decision? And so signal detection theory starts to try and parse these apart. Um, it provides a way to measure this perceptual sensitivity, so to measure these absolute thresholds, um, and to kind of separate it from the decision-making style. So what you typically have when you're doing um, a signal detection theory experiment is you are looking at something like this, where you have the stimulus, and the experimenter knows, did they present the stimulus or did they not? And what they're going to do is half the time they're going to present the stimulus, and half the time they're going to not. Um, when the stimulus is presented and you get it right, that's a hit. When the stimulus was not presented and you say you saw it or you say you heard it, that's a false alarm. Um, when the stimulus was presented and you don't say you saw it, that's a miss. And when the stimulus was not presented um, and you say you didn't see it, that's a correct rejection. Okay, so what we're really looking for is hits versus correct rejections. If you're doing this perfectly, um, you will have 50% hits and 50% correct rejections because half the time the stimulus is there and half the time the stimulus is not. <clears throat> so this decision-making bias, um, again, in this signal detection experiment, it's your tendency to either be liberal or conservative in deciding whether it was there or not. Um, so did you, okay, maybe I saw it, so yes, that would be pretty liberal. Um, well, maybe I saw it, I don't want to say I did, if I didn't, that would be conservative. And again, we each have different biases in our perceptions and how we're willing to answer these questions. Um, and signal detection theory will start to show you that on the curve. Um, again, that neural activity, those spikes evoked by a stimulus, tends to increase as the intensity of the stimulus increases. That makes it easier for us to detect that it's there. So the more neural activity we have, the easier it is for us to get a hit. Um, whereas <clears throat> when, it's, when there's not a lot of intensity of that stimulus, it's going to be harder for us to get a hit because there's not as much neural activity. So again, signal detection theory starts to parse these things apart. There was a really great, great launchpad um, experiment where you can run through a signal detection theory. Um, that's very, very helpful. Um, and it will help you run through the different terms that are important, such as hits and false alarms miss and correct rejections, and it will also walk you through uh, the receiver operating characteristic. Um, and this is the curve that represents the quality of the performance. And so what's really neat is you'll get uh, an ROC for you. Um, and there'll be two different ones that you get to go through. So you get two different ROCs and you can see how they compare based on these um, the differences in stimulation. So that ends chapter one. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and I'll see you in chapter two.